We just came back from a camp, a whole weekend camp. Friday night, Saturday, the whole day, and almost the whole night. And this morning, the whole morning. And um, I'm not sure I have enough words to describe how amazing it was. <laughs> we were praying for each person in that camp to have an encounter with God, an encounter face to face with God. And uh, I believe from volunteers to people working in the kitchen, Chantal, <laughs> and from ev for everyone else, that encounter was real. And one thing that I have in my heart and one thing that I pursue with my whole strength is that to have everyday encounters with God. Sometimes our encounters are quick, right? We're busy, our minds are everywhere. But God really wants to encounter with us deeply. And that weekend was a mark. This weekend was a mark for each one that was there. We started on, on Friday evening talking about God's calling for humankind. And the, the calling is this place of intimacy. Then we spoke about soul ties and sexual sin. And we went on speaking about rejecting the world and welcoming the Lord into our lives. We continued talking about intimacy with God. And on Saturday night we spoke about as it is in heaven. And literally, I, some, during that sermon, during that worship, I just felt like there was no roof. It was just heaven. You picture 40 children crying, I mean children, me, <laughs> crying in the presence of God. Nobody was even touching them yet. It's just God ministering to their hearts. And we had a, such a powerful time of prayer and such a powerful time of encountering Him while we were praying for each other. And this morning, I, then on Saturday night, I just felt like God was saying, change the schedule, give the schedule to me. Um, everything was there, set up in a way. And I didn't know how to do it. But I just said, you know what, let's worship God. And in the morning we started worshiping God. And he laid on my heart a specific word. And the next thing, thing that I could see is this 20 something people in front giving their lives to God. And saying, I'm yours. I'm yours forever. I'm yours. And wow. And so many other things. We had this great time, sir. And I'm very thankful that there's a lot of faithful warriors here because we're very tired. But they came. They came to the evening service. And we're very excited about tonight as well. We're talking about, we're continuing to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. And um, we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount for about seven or eight weeks, if I'm not wrong. And there's so much more in here for us to learn. And it joins exactly with where we left on the camp on how to walk with God. We start the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. So if you want to open your Bible there, uh, we will also put it on the screen. If you're opening your Bible, Matthew chapter 5. These are the promises that Jesus gave us. And those promises will follow to those who obey what he's telling us to. The first one is, is saying, 
Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain, mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he continued, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I love that one. <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted, because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here Jesus is speaking to his disciples. But first of all, we have two groups here that did not follow Jesus. For those who followed, Jesus called them disciples. For those who did not follow, we will have two types of people. The first one are sinners. They're totally apart from God. The second one are the religious people. They were called Pharisees. They were also called hypocrites from Jesus. And there are two main reactions from Jesus towards these two groups. The first one, Jesus loved the sinners. We were just singing about that. There was a, a teacher, I think I spoke about that a little bit last week, that came into my, my uh, office asking me to clarify about the word jealousy. Because people in her class were saying that God sins because he's jealous. But that word actually means zealousy, being zealous. That actually the root of it is an intense, passionate love towards humankind. The Lord loves us intensely. He will pursue us until He finds us. And believe me, you can hide. <laughs> you can hide. You can resist. But He will find you. He will find you. He will find everyone. Once we get in that position of which Jesus told us to. And you, you know which position is that? The position of loving. Is the position of praying. Is the position of not giving up. There was a guy back there um, in Wooster when I was a pastor in a church there that we prayed for him for about a year and he never showed up. He was going out, bars, ladies, all crazy. And one day he showed up in our life group and God started working in his life and all of a sudden he was one of our leaders and he was on fire for God and that is amazing. We should do that. We should be the ones who love the sinners, who love the ones that do not walk with God. The second group, the religious people. And Jesus had a strong rejection towards them. In fact, Jesus warned his disciples, be careful with them. Do not do as they do. Because that is not what I want you to do. He actually gave these hypocrite people seven warns. Seven. Very strong warns. Very strong woes. Imagine Jesus saying, Woe to you! And you are a strong man. He went straight to the heart of the thing. And this is recorded in, in Matthew chapter 23. When he comes to the Pharisees and he starts saying, you know, I think the first thing that he says is that they did not recognize the time of their visitation. 
They did not see the king of kings coming into Jerusalem. In fact, it was right after Jesus had his triumph, triumphal entry. And the children and the poor, they were singing Hosanna to the king. And the Pharisees went crazy and started saying, make them stop. Make them stop now. This is not working. This is not going to work. This is not the way it should be. And we will see just now why they did that. Jesus said, listen, if I do that, those stones will start singing. They are recognizing the time of their visitation. And then Jesus just keeps on. And he starts speaking against the Pharisees. Starts also warning his disciples, do not be like them. The first woe, you don't need to open, but just follow with me. It is in Matthew 23, 13 that says... But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven, heaven in people's faces. For neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Sure, this is serious. Jesus is saying, you are shutting the kingdom of heaven to people because of the way you are living. And when we connect it, when we go back to the Beatitudes, the first Beatitude, what is, in, is written there? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Help me, guys. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You can read. You can uh, use the, the help of the book. Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We can see exactly where the problem is. When the Pharisees weren't poor in spirit, when they were full of themselves, to be poor in spirit is basically to acknowledge your spiritual bankruptcy before God and your need for Him. That you cannot live without Him. That you need His forgiveness. That you need everything that you, He has for you. You don't have it in yourself. I don't have it in myself. But it is in Him. The Pharisees, with their pride, the religious hypocrite people, shut the kingdom of heaven to people. But the poor in spirit and the disciples, by walking... As poor in spirit would be examples to others and would draw people near to God by their behavior. The disciples enter the kingdom through the spiritual bankruptcy. Religious people, the second woe. Show sure, this is a strong one, man. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single disciple. And when he, becomes a, he becomes a disciple, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Yo. <laughs> this is very, very strong. Teachers have the ability to convince people I'm not a very good teacher, but I, I guess there are many teachers here, or some teachers here, and they're good at convincing people to believe or to do what they want them to do. And the Pharisees were doing that. And if we do another connection quickly, back to the Beatitudes, from the second woe to the second Beatitude, what is it written there? Blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. You might be thinking, okay, I don't see the connection, but I will explain to you. Blessed are those who mourn. You are poor in spirit. You are acknowledging your spiritual bankruptcy. And then you mourn. You have a contrite heart. 
before God. And this is exactly what the disciples have. In the contrite heart, Jesus never rejects. If you are not able to cry over and mourn and feel that you are a sinner, have you ever done that? If you are not able to constantly in your life for God and cry before Him with everything that you are, everything that you have, everything that you want to have and everything that you want to be, if you're not able to cry before Him and say, Lord, have mercy on me. King David had a very beautiful prayer in Psalm 51 where he says, Create him in me, O Lord, a pure heart. Do not allow your Holy Spirit to go away from me. I need you. To mourn is not only to cry the loss of the beloved ones, it's also to cry over our own sins and our own life. And the Pharisees did not do that. The religious people cannot cry over their own sins because they are so perfect. They have such a good relationship with rules. But that they miss. <laughs> they miss the one who created the principles and who guide us through our lives. But Jesus continues. He gives the third woe. And he says, blind guide, guides. He says, woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, if it, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater? The gift on the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever, whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. They had everything backwards. They focused on the superficial and not on the significant. They focused on the material, what they can inherit. And if we make a way back, the third beatitude, what is it written there? Blessed are the meek because... Sorry? I can't hear. I need to hear. They will inherit the earth. Okay? Everybody sees the meek as someone humble, right? But that is not the... Re it's one of its faces, but it's not the main of it all. If we want to see the meek, we need to see the one that was the meekest man on earth, apart from Jesus. It was Moses. When, G when God called him the meekest man on earth, he, his brother and his sister started speaking against him because he had married a Cushite woman, of which she is basically a black woman. It's exactly what it says there in the Hebrew. An African woman. So now you can go out and say, Moses was married to an African woman. And I can prove it to you. He was. Maybe South African, who knows. But he was there, and they were speaking against him, and they started saying, you know, God also speaks through us. God also does miracles through us. So if he is making this mistake, Ha, ha, ha. I can take his place. 
I can be like him. Right? They were all wild on their own rebellion and their own thing. And you know what Moses did? He took his, what do you call that thing? I keep on forgetting the name. And hit them in the head. Did he do that? No. Did he ask God to open the ground to eat them? No. You know what he did? He went and he prayed. He submitted everything to God. First thing, he submitted his life to God. He submitted his position to God. He submitted his career, if we could put it in that way, to God. And he trusted God's supernatural provision, not only for what he was doing, for, but also for who he was. And God called him the meekest man on earth. He wasn't bound by the natural things. His inheritance wasn't on earth. And just a little bit of a warn to us Christians, because sometimes we get so annoyed and so connected with earthly things, with the way of doing things, don't we? We are so connected with our money. It is holding like this and it doesn't open. We are so connected with things that we have, it, with things that belong to us. But God is calling us in a different direction, in a total different direction. God is calling us to have an attitude of thankfulness and dependence on His provision in everything in our lives. He's calling us into meekness. He's calling us to trust Him completely. The fourth one. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out the knot and swallowing a camel. They did all things, all the right things, for the wrong reasons. They again focused on the rules and missed the blessings. Tithing is important. Offering is important. It actually holds a very important place in the Bible. But when we make it so important on how much you give, almost like, and that I know it doesn't happen here, it's just on the church on the other side of the road, but when we, they make it so important how much they give, to even, even to the place that they think the pastor is their employee, and he has to do what they want them to do. It's difficult, but it happens a lot. That they have to command, and they have to tell the rules, and they have to say this, because... Their sense of importance comes from what they give and not for, from whom made them. They were doing that. They were ruling and finding themselves more important than others because they were successful. And Jesus is calling it on their faces. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. very strong and when we look into the fourth and fifth beatitude we will understand it it says blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled blessed are the merciful for they will find mercy we can clearly understand that the righteousness that Jesus is teaching to his disciples isn't a righteousness of rules of things, but one of a relationship that reflects justice, mercy, and faithfulness. 
In fact, Isaiah 58 from verse 6 to 9 says this. Look at this. Is not this the kind of fasting, fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with, with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and you will say, Here I am. God is calling us to have mercy, to walk in justice and being faithful. This has to be the driving force in our lives. To have mercy, this is very powerful, very powerful, because we will find mercy. The sixth woe, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. They cleaned the outside of the plate, but inside they were full of greed and self-indulgence. When the disciples, on the other hand, were called to have a strong inside-out faith. If you look into the sixth beatitude, what is it saying there? Blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. They will see God. Wow. Seeing God doesn't mean going to heaven. Seeing God means seeing what He's doing, experiencing Him, walking a road with Him. But if that faith and if that your walk is not from inside, is not something that drives from inside, a desire that you have on top of your list, Instead of that, if your life is just on the outside, on the beautiful thing, there's no God in that. There's just you. The seventh woe that says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in, that day, in, in the days of our fathers we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. And he keeps on talking to them about it. And if there was one thing that the religious people of that time did the most, is that they resisted the work of the Holy Spirit. They were passionate about rules, but they knew nothing about what God was doing. They were passionate about the ways they did things. But that was all empty. That was all from themselves. They ended up killing the prophets, crucifying Jesus, and resisting to all sorts of changes that God so wanted to bring in their time. And this is very serious. Because if we go back, we will see the last two beatitudes that, says, that say, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We are, as disciples, we are called to be peacemakers. And we are called to give back in the opposite spirit. We are not called when we are persecuted, when people criticize us, when people throw stones at us, to throw them back. I had a situation in the camp. We were sleeping in a room, and there was a bathroom just on the side of my room. And on Saturday morning at 5 o'clock in the morning, people went to use the bathroom. Sure, I could hear everything. <laughs> Pee and all that stuff. And I was not happy about that. But then the guys that were sleeping there in the campsite, it wasn't our people, they started talking very loud and they started laughing and they started doing a whole sort of things at 5 in the morning. And then I went to speak to them after a few minutes and I spoke to them, please don't make too much noise, we have a daughter that is sleeping and nothing happened. They actually increased their voice. And I went there four times. And the fourth time, believe me, I was looking for the fire extinguisher to just five o'clock in the morning. I wasn't thinking that right. But that was what I wanted to do, you know. But then I decided, you know what, I will do what is right. So I just bowed my head in front of the bathroom and I just prayed, Lord, I give this situation to you. I give this to you and I, mm, I bless them. <laughs> I bless them, Lord. <laughs> it was a good word to say. Bless them, Lord. Oh, inside of me, I wanted to say so many other things. And as I turn around, an older man comes to me. They were all, by the way, on, on their 40s and 50s. An older man come to, comes to me, greets me, and asks me, are you all right? Because you can imagine my face. <laughs> Fighting with God. And I said, um, no, I'm not. I'm sorry, I'm not all right. The guys that, that are with you, they're making such a mockery. They're laughing out loud. They're talking out loud. I ask them with a lot of respect, and they just don't stop. I have a baby in my room. She's sleeping, and she's waking up, and we are all tired. I'm leading the camp. And then I was just blah, 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 on him the whole time. And shame, the old man was looking at me with a lot of compassion. And he said, you know what, I will sort it out. And when he got close to the bathroom, the two 50 years old guys came out. They looked like children. Man. And they said, we're not speaking loud. We're not speaking loud. And they quieted down and then walked away. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. It's a very interesting story. It's a very interesting thing. I was still angry with them, by the way. I mean, I was. I will not lie. But I think that was something that lo the Lord really taught me. You know, keep on following me. Keep on blessing people that persecute you. And I think, and I speak that to myself as well. I think every opportunity that we have, when things like that happen, not only specifically being persecuted or being attacked or anything else. This is not Satan, okay? Or maybe Satan is even there trying to pull you out of God's presence by pulling out of you reactions. They are not according to the Word of God. But in the same way, those, oppor those are opportunities for us to be faithful and see God's blessings coming through. I remember once with patience. I was in Brazil, I had to put something through the career, and if I didn't put it through, I was going to have to travel to two hours to another city on the day, the next day, early in the morning, to give that thing through. 
because it was a, an important work document. I get there five minutes, I think it was three, before the thing closes. And when I walk in, the guy looks at me and says, I'm so sorry, but the system just stopped. I can't do one thing. I'm trying to finish my job here, and I can't do anything about it. And I'm like, I had actually ran for about 10 minutes with a document on my arm. I was sweating. Brazil is very hot. And then I turned around, and in that moment, I just had that light. You know, just say thank you. And they just walked out and say, you know what, thank you, Lord, because you were faithful, you were good, and you know all things. I don't know not anything, but I submit everything to you. And as I finish the prayer, the guy shouts from inside, come back, come back, the system came back. And then I came back running, and I gave the paper to him. And he put it through. And the next one on the queue that had also come back quickly, came to give the paper, and then he says, the system just stopped again. And I was like, hmm, there is a power, né? but if I went away angry and saying bad things, and you know, I would have missed an opportunity, not only to learn from God, but also to see his provision coming through to my life. And this is what it is saying here. It is saying so many other things. If you want to really follow a Christian lifestyle and if you want to grow every day in your life, sit in front of these few verses in Matthew 5. And I talk to you that is been walking with God for very long and to you that has been walking with God just now. It doesn't matter. If, it, if the Spirit of God doesn't make it new for you, then there is something wrong. If the, if the Word of God does not come alive to you, then there is something that you should actually come to God and ask Him why. Because the Word of God is living and active. It is powerful. And this is our guide. And this is where the Lord wants to take us. He wants us to be channels of miracles and provision and salvation to those around us. Amen. I gave you a few notes, a few things, and it's just a little bit of reflection on the Sermon on the Mount. And it says, it is a time to be poor in spirit again. Walking humbly with God, having a teachable heart. It is time to mourn and repent, to have a prayer attitude of contrition and confession, crying before God. It is a time to be meek, depending totally upon God's supernatural provision for us, in good and in bad times. It is time to be thankful for what we have and focus on what God is doing instead of getting annoyed and annoying with rules and earthly things. Trust in the Word. It is time to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness that comes from, from God and reflects mercy, justice, and faithfulness instead of walking in a righteousness that is self-centered, selfish, and self-justifying. It is time to raise a ba the banner of an inside-out faith. It is time to strengthen our faith on the inside and express God's mercy, justice, and faithfulness towards others. It is time to strengthen our walking love towards others and towards God. Love covers a multitude of sins, and it is the bond of per perfection. Live a passionate life, reaching out with smiles and with a big heart to welcome the new time of visitation, to see God. And finally, it's time to ask God to open our hearts and eyes to the new things that He is doing, so that we can be a, a, an effective part of it and not only spectators, not only watching.
Amen. Shall we pray? Father, we just want to thank you and we want to ask you to help us, to guide us, to lead us in the direction of your kingdom, to make us, Lord, disciples of your kingdom, change makers, light and salt in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we all leave, I just wanted to let you know that we've got a very nice ice cream at, at the back. It's a different one today. So don't run away. Just come along with us, chat a bit, and um, yeah, chat about the word. And let's have some fun. Can we say the benediction? I'm not sure it will be on the... Um, screen. Oh, it's there. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.